Today, on episode 34 of the Fit Stoic Podcast, excellence is not only possible, it's assured. We'll explore the possibilities that you have in the moment of choice, and I'm going to offer you a frame that you can use when you do things that, frankly, you wish you hadn't. All right, welcome to the show. I'm Corey Samuelson. Today we're looking at the moment of choice and what we can possibly do and what we can choose to do in that moment. Now, if you're anything like me, there are probably moments that you wish you could have back. When we think about the Stoic sage, this is the ideal individual in Stoic philosophy. The Stoic sage basically never makes a mistake. Oh, that is why the sage, it's a myth. It's not something that anybody could ever achieve. And that's really good news, I think, because then we don't have to keep beating ourselves up for not being perfect. We can strive for excellence, but that level of excellence can always move forward or higher or basically get better. So even when we make mistakes, we can do better next time. And that is a big part of what this episode is all about today. So this is chapter 27 from the Jim Chiridion, and we'll just get right into it. Begin quote, If it is within your power of choice, it is possible. Not only possible, assured. The outcomes will unfold as they may, but the choice to be excellent remains. Anything less than choosing excellence of thought, word, or deed is your doing. To be frank, only the sage gets this right all the time. Yet the possibility of getting it right this time, this one time, is your choice. And that choice is available every time. You can never have done anything else. You can always do something else. End quote. This chapter dives deep into the repercussions of accepting the dichotomy of control of Stoic philosophy. And that is described, remember, as being that some things are in our control and some things are outside of our control or our power to choose. What is described as being within our power basically is things like our opinion, our motivation, our desire, And in a word, what we choose, what we can choose, what's open to us to choose. And everything that is outside of that choice is beyond our power. We cannot simply choose it. So that then includes our body, our reputation, our possessions, and the results of the actions that we take which then gets back to, as well, this idea of the proresis as the essence of our self, that we are, in essence, the faculty of choice, the faculty of volition, of will. This chapter then suggests that what is within our choice is not only a possibility, but it's assured, it's guaranteed, Anything that is within your choice only requires that you make that choice. What I'm getting at is that anything that is within your power of choice is merely a matter of choice. So you can test out the possibility here of what you could do simply through choice. By doing this, you will be able to explore what you can do and what you can influence in your life 
simply by focusing on choice as opposed to struggling. Because remember, not only is it possible if it's within your choice, it is assured because all it will take is to make the choice. Something we need to get a handle on here is, aside from what's possible in the moment of choice, is when are moments of choice? That might seem like a kind of a strange question because we generally consider that well, we just go about our lives always with the ability to choose. And we do have that ability, but it is not presented to us by our own physiology 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It's actually fleeting moments of the ability to choose, to consciously direct our attention to what's happening and what we want to have happen, what we would prefer to have happen. Let's look at an example so that we can wrap our heads around this a little easier. So let's imagine that there is an individual who has trouble with his eating habits to the point where he considers himself a binge eater. And that being somebody who is fairly strict and regimented for most of the day or most of the week as far as their eating is concerned. But every once in a while, because of that discipline, we'll say, because of that restriction that he puts upon himself, every once in a while, his body rebels and basically says, no, I want to eat and I'm eating beyond anything that you would try to control in me. And he finds his head in the fridge, in the cupboard, just grabbing whatever food there is and just going to town and eating beyond what he considers when he's conscious and when he has that ability to choose beyond what he would choose for himself. So what's happening in that case? Speaking in very broad terms here, there is the amygdala part of the brain, which is a more emotional way of thinking. We have the prefrontal cortex, which is more the conscious part of us, what we consider, when we think from here, we consider this is me, we use the word I, and it's that executive function. We make choices, we make decisions. And then the amygdala, which is a more emotional way of thinking. Again, I'm speaking in very broad terms here. I'm not trying to be scientific. I'm just giving you an idea. Now, what the amygdala has as a potential is that it can actually block the prefrontal cortex from doing what it does. So it shuts off the ability to choose when there is something that the brain, through you know the use of the senses and whatnot, interprets as a threat to survival. So where we you know see something out of the corner of our eye, it looks like you know perhaps we're hiking and it looks like something is running beside us. It's that that quick, what the hell is going on? It's that part of the brain that basically shoves a bunch of hormones into the bloodstream and, and basically gets us ready to, you know, fight, flee, to act on what is potentially a, a threat. And then it's, oh, it's just my buddy or it's just the dog that we brought along or heck, it's just somebody else's dog. Then we can calm down. But in the moment, the brain just says, forget thinking, we got to act. And that's what the amygdala can do here. So when it comes to this person, this guy that has trouble with his binge eating, it's very similar. It might not be as dramatic, but there will come a time where 
the deprivation that he is choosing to put his body through because he's trying to lose weight or whatever, the body just says, forget this, I'm eating. And it puts blinders on. It gives a kind of tunnel vision. And all of a sudden, he is, he identifies as that binge eating behavior. And any ability to choose anything else isn't an option. He doesn't see it. All he sees is time to eat. What's over here? That looks good. What's, oh, what's up there? That looks great. And it's just eat, eat, eat. When the body is satisfied with the calories that have gone in, then suddenly it's like, oh, he kind of comes to. And then he has the ability to choose again. However, there is the repercussions, the consequences of that binge eating. And the executive function, that ability to choose, that prefrontal cortex, now looks back and thinks, I shouldn't have done that. I'm such an idiot. Why can't I control myself? And there wasn't a possibility of control. Think of it this way. If you're standing on the edge of a diving board, and you're, say, five, six feet above the water, as soon as you jump off, there is no more, oh, I just won't fall. You're falling down. Very similar in this case. Once that binge eating for this fellow has kicked in to the program that is within the brain, and I use the word program again, very broad terms here. It's just a metaphor. When that way of thinking comes forward, then the ability to choose to not fall because of gravity, to not eat because that is what the brain has said is going to happen, not to jump in fear because, again, the brain says, that's what's happening here. This is important enough that I'm just, you don't get a choice. That is the power that is in the physiology. And so my point being, there are moments of choice. And sometimes the body, the brain, just says, okay, there is no choice here. This is too important. This is why I talk about training conditioning and why even though I just moments ago used the word programming the brain and our thinking and our routines and what we do on a daily basis they are not programs like a computer computer you just put the program in and then it runs as long as there's no bugs right but it's going to run the same as long as the conditions of if X, then Y. That's it. We can set that kind of thinking up for ourselves as well. If it's 6 o'clock in the evening, then I eat supper. So at 4.30, it's like, oh, I'm hungry. Well, it's not 6 yet. Okay, if 6, then supper. But in this case, if 4.30, then no eating. That doesn't work like a computer. You can try to force yourself where we consciously just say, okay, I'm not eating. And that is an ability that we have. But if the brain itself considers that the survival of the body is at stake, and it could be not as dramatic as that. It could just be, no, you're hungry. You're going to eat because otherwise something bad's going to happen. And then, like I said, that amygdala, which is a more emotional way of thinking, basically says, okay, you're cut off. You know, you're trying to get us, you're trying to hurt us by not eating when we need to eat. Then, boom, no more choice. Let's go to the fridge. And away you go. 
And then again, you come to the brain says, we're safe now. Control is back in your hands. The interesting thing here is that there are vast parts of this, this guy's life. Remember, we're talking about this hypothetical individual with binge eating issues. There are vast parts of his life where he is not a binge eater and where he can exert that executive function and that ability to make choices and decisions. But when that behavior comes to the fore, the ability to choose goes away. And when that happens, he experiences the world as a binge eater. And all the other possible options for behavior, for example, getting a glass of water, waiting five minutes, going for a walk, just having a healthy snack, just something that's, okay, this will tide me over until I'm scheduled to eat. All of those options, done. They aren't there. It's like they don't even exist. So what I'm getting at is that moments of having the ability to choose can be quite brief. If the brain decides, if the body kind of goes into survival mode, that window of opportunity to make a choice that is in alignment, that is consistent with the standards that you hold for yourself, they may close quickly. The error that we can make is that we can identify ourselves with our behavior. I even teach this as something to help clarify the choices that we are making. I put it this way. You identify yourself by your actions. You are what you do consistently. Now, are you literally what you do consistently or what you even do once in a while? No, absolutely not. As a way of looking, however, at your own life and what you have been conditioned or chosen to do often enough that it becomes a habit, thinking in this way is useful because if we look at this binge eating person again, he is a binge eater when he is a binge eater, but if he identifies only as that, as if he walks around thinking, I'm a binge eater, as opposed to, well, I'm also a husband, or I'm an executive, or I'm an athlete, I'm a hockey player, you know, all of these other options that he has to identify with, if that identity that he's struggling with, that he beats himself up about, if that takes on more of his conscious attention and therefore more of his non-conscious attention as well, then that behavior becomes easier to access. It becomes more of a conditioned response when the stimulus of hunger comes up. So as a means to understand yourself, the aphorism of you are what you do consistently and you can identify yourself by your actions has value. But again, I'm going to say this for emphasis. Are you what you do? Do you have to identify yourself with your actions? No, absolutely not. The utility of that aphorism, you identify yourself by your actions. By looking at what you do, you see who you are, which I have said is not literally true. But the usefulness of it is that you can actually look at what you've been conditioned to do. And then you can start making choices. So another aphorism that I use, and it came from, and it came right at the end of the chapter that I just read. You can never 
have done anything else. You can always do something else. From a Stoic perspective, there is something called fate. And put it, putting it simply, I describe fate as this. Fate is what happened. The Stoics look at it as fate is something that we can't escape. That there is a, a fate that we will encounter regardless of what we try to do about it. But the thing is, we don't know what that fate is. But we do know what happened. So to my thinking, what happened, that's fate. Because it can't not have happened because it did happen. So we still can choose going forward. But as far as what happened, we don't have choice in that anymore. So we can't have done anything else because that's what we did. Don't beat yourself up about it anymore. Whether it was a poor choice that you made consciously or whether it was something that, again, that amygdala hijacked out of you and just, you know, in quotes, forced you to do, just took you along for the ride, that's what happened. So you couldn't have done anything else. But you can always choose to do something else now. So in the case of the binge eater, he can look at that behavior and come up with something else. He can create one of those if-then algorithms that computer programmers use. But it's not a matter of programming. It's a matter of conditioning, which is why I use those words. Training, conditioning. It's not just plug it in and it takes care of itself from then forward. Even if it works once, you can't relax about it. You have to keep choosing that response. If six o'clock, then eat supper. But that doesn't become a computer program as far as the brain and the physiology is concerned. It is going to take conditioning. It's going to keep taking effort and choice. Some days it's going to be very easy. Some days it's going to be very challenging. Over time and over that conditioning process, the brain is going to learn, okay, I can feel hungry at 4.30 and not be in a panic and not have to take things into my own hands, into the body's own hands, so to speak. A couple of things to keep in mind. The ability to choose is, in essence, who we are. Yet, we can look at the behavior that we realize, that we make real in the moment, and we can, we can use that to look at how we've be, been conditioned. So whether that is through chance, where we just aren't paying attention and we're just kind of going with the flow and getting influenced by our environment or by other people, or whether it is the choices that we are making, that we are consciously conditioning ourselves. Either of those, over time, will then become our regular behavior, our consistent behavior. And again, whether those are the things that we prefer or the things that we would rather not do and would not prefer to have, you know, realized in our life, both of those we identify with on some level. So we can look at our behavior and what we end up doing. Remember, we can't have done anything else. So we can look at what we've done and realize, 
Okay. These are things that are conditioned in me. Now, what am I going to choose to do? So I can't have done anything else, but now what am I going to choose to do moving forward? And this is what I was saying at the beginning about the sage. That is something to aspire toward in that in every moment, it would be great if we made the excellent choice. However, we are not mythological creatures. We are simply human beings doing the best that we can. So even though the sage will make the excellent choice in every moment, we have the possibility to make the excellent choice in any moment. Whether we do or not, that remains to be seen. When you're aware that you have a moment in which you can choose, and you are aware of the choices that are available, remember that the excellence that you would have, that is available to you, that is up to you, is not only possible, but if you do make that choice, it is assured. Now to reiterate, this doesn't mean the results, the consequences are assured. Those are beyond your power. But that you choose excellence, that you identify with that excellence, that you experience yourself realizing that excellence in that moment, all it requires of you is to make that choice. And then events unfold as they may. People respond as they will. And that is all out of your hands. But that frame that you can use here of you can never have done anything else, you can always choose to do something else, is to remind you that the past, that was fate. It's out of your hands. You can't do anything about fate because it's already happened. What you do next, what you choose to do next, however, that is up to you. And whether the body responds the way that you want it to, whether it moves, whether the skill of maybe throwing a dart at a dartboard to hit the bullseye or to get the triple 20, whether the next words that you choose to influence somebody in a sale, whether you make that high jump in that competition that you're in, knowing that this is going to be a personal best. Any of that out of your hands, but the choice to realize that excellence, the choice to hold yourself to that standard, the choice to get the triple 20, the choice to hit the bullseye, the choice to make the sale and to provide value to your customer, the choice to clear the high bar in the competition. That is what is within your power. And that's all you need to know. So that whatever happens, the dart misses the board. The sale, the customer decides not to buy. You knock the bar off the uprights with your heel. If you think of it this way, that was fate. Nothing else could have happened in that scenario because that is what happened. Now what? Don't beat yourself up about it. Nothing else could have happened because that is what happened. Looking at life and the choices that you make and the results that you create from that perspective, it's a much more gentle way of handling mistakes and poor choices and poor results. And I think that 
it's a much better way to go through a day, a week, a month, or a life. To actually have that ability to be gentle and to not beat yourself up. You can never have done anything else. Look at what happened. Learn from what happened. And use the next moment of choice to choose a higher level of excellence. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of the Fit Stoic Podcast, please do share it with someone that you believe might like it too. This is Corey. Whatever your circumstance, operate with excellence.